We're gonna talk about rest for the last time because um, we've been talking about rest so much, you've been falling asleep in church. And uh, I thought, well, they look restful or I just am not preaching very well. But ultimately, uh, I want you to know that your rest, um, ultimately, I'll, there's gonna be a tension as long as we're here between work and rest. You know that, right? And, and it's, and you were never designed to completely rest in this state, in, in this, um, in this life. It was never designed for you to be totally, um, complete because, because there's the sin issue. There's the separation from God issue. And, and we are not made perfect until the end. Amen. And so, what happens in our society is we're all trying to figure out how to do it all completely now. If I could completely rest today, if I can completely rest uh, next week, if I can completely rest, if I could retire and completely rest. By the way, if you're retired, anybody figured that out? Because the crazy part is if you, if you have a family and you're retired, then your kids are probably having kids. And everybody's telling me we're getting ready to have uh, a grandkid in July and everybody's telling me it's the best thing and I think it will be but I think it'll also be tiring <laughs> right I think it'll also be exhausting uh, because I already did it I already did it all I did uh, we, we raised three kids we put in our time <laughs> so um, I keep hearing it's amazing but it's work so you can't, so even when you get older, right? The writer of Hebrews talks today about, about a rest that you will never get up from, that you will never have to work for, that you will never, that we're striving towards it now, but once we experience that rest is an eternal rest. And I'm so thankful for that, amen? Now, if you're wired like me, it, it, might, it, it might cause you a little bit of, uh, trepidation because I don't, I don't really like laying around and resting very much. So this idea of eternal rest, I don't want you to get the idea that you're going to go to heaven floating around a cloud for eternity, because that would be the most awful thing that God could ever do to us. Um, that's not what he's, that's not what the, what our ultimate rest looks like. Our ultimate rest is, is can you ever imagine a life not impacted by sin? And you may say, well, Chris, I don't sin very much. Well, that's debatable, but what if nobody else around you sinned? What if you woke up tomorrow and everyone was perfect? That'd be restful, wouldn't it? You never have to worry about anything because it would all be perfect. And so the writer of Hebrews says we should strive towards that end. And that end is found in Christ. And we're gonna, we're gonna read through a decent amount of the chapter three and chapter four of Hebrews. I pray that you would follow along with me. And we're gonna talk about this ultimate rest. And then, um, and, and I hope everyone here would strive towards it. Why don't you stand to your feet in honor of the word as we read it. Hebrews chapter three, we'll start in verse one. And I'm going to read a good bit, so I hope nobody falls asleep standing up. But here we go. Hebrews chapter 3, say amen if you're ready. Yeah. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory glory as the builder of the house was more honorable than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant who to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. 
Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care brothers, lest you be in any of you, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confession, confidence firm to the end. As it is, as it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not unified, united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, the, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. See what the writer of Hebrews is doing there? He's back, back and forth, back and forth. All right, verse six of chapter four. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day today saying that, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest is also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joint and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who we must give account. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we pray that as we hear it, God wouldn't just hear it, we'd apply it. We pray Lord that we would be people who strive towards that rest. Help us do that today. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. The writer of Hebrews starts out in chapter three. By the way, um, we're not really sure who wrote Hebrews. So if you think the apostle Paul wrote it, probably not. He probably didn't. We're not really confident who wrote it. So that's, I don't, that's why I say the writer of Hebrews. So the writer of Hebrews starts out chapter three. He's comparing Moses following the commands of God, leading people and Jesus. And he makes the comparison that Jesus is greater than Moses. And, and that's, an, that's an important thing to write to Jewish people, to Jews. And, and the writer of Hebrews is making this distinction. Moses was amazing. And if you keep, if you, if you read through all of Hebrews, you see, you see that he makes references to the tabernacle, to the temple, to Moses, to the high priest, to all these, all these Jewish important figures. And he makes the case, Jesus is higher than all of them. Jesus is the Messiah. So he's making the case to Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. He gets to this place where he starts talking about rest and unbelief, rest and unbelief. And he, and he keeps going back uh, to a Psalm uh, that David wrote and, and he, he starts comparing this rest that is available and the unbelief of the Israelites uh, when after Moses led them out of Egypt. And some of you may remember Numbers ch uh, chapter 13 of Numbers, 
the Israelites get to the edge of the promised land under Moses' rule. He, God has miraculously delivered them out of Egypt, all the plagues, the Passover, and they walk out of Egypt. They get to the Red Sea, and you, you, everybody's watched the, the movie, right? Whether it's Charlton Heston or the, or the cartoon. Um, everybody's seen where, where, where however they work it out, God split the Red Sea, the Israelites walk across it, and then it closes in on the Egyptians, and he miraculously leads them out of there. And he provides, he provides, he provides. They get to the edge of the promised land, and he tells them, send in people to go look. And so Moses gets somebody from, a leader from each tribe, 12, and they send them in, and they come back with this, hey man, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, and it's unbelievable, but there's also giants. Called them the Nephilim. There's also these giants in the land and we don't know if we can, and there's all these powerful people. We don't know if we can overtake them. And there was two guys, Joshua and Caleb. They went, hey, we can do this. But they were overwhelmed by the other 10. The other 10 worked up the whole nation and they revolted against God. And God went, okay. Matter of fact, he told Moses, step aside. I'll just get rid of all of them. Aren't you glad for Moses right now? Moses interceded for the Israelites and he decided to save them. But he said that you will not, this generation will not enter into the promised land because you rejected me. And so that's when the writer of Hebrews starts saying in the, in the rebellion, that's what he's talking about. In the rebellion, they, 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 they latched onto unbelief. There was this, Hey, we, God just brought you out of Egypt. The, the most powerful Reign, nation on the planet, regime, the most powerful, and he just miraculously walked you out by Moses, who was a sheep herder at the time. And now we get to something difficult, and you're not going to trust me. Okay. So now the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, as great as you thought Moses was, Jesus is better. And Jesus has gone before us and prepared a rest for us that we have to strive towards. That has to be our ultimate goal. That has to be a, the ultimate thing we want to attain. And don't you dare hear this word and end up like the Israelites. That's his message to, to Jews after Jesus has died and resurrected. He's like, don't hear the good news and then run off in unbelief. And not, and not get to the rest. Don't do that. So he says a couple things in here that are super important for the church of today. He says, exhort one another. Hebrews, he says this in chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Be careful that there not be an evil heart in any of you. Now, I know all of you are good people, mostly. What, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is like, listen, don't get into a circumstance where you let unbelief and evil rise up in your heart in a group of other believers. Okay, so here's what he says. He says, but exhort one another Every day, as long it is, as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, as it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. So he's telling the church, don't any of you start going down a path of sin and unbelief. Don't any of you get locked into sin. Are you following me? And he said, it's the job of the church. It's the job of each of us. Look at your neighbor. Look at him, right? If, if you're related to him or not. If you're related to him, this could be really difficult and awkward. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, hey, it's your job to exhort me and it's my job to exhort you. To go ahead and tell him. And, and can I also let you know, this is not nagging. This is not a to-do list. This is not nagging. This is us protecting each other from hell. You say, Chris, it's the week before Easter. Ease up a little bit. 
The writer of Hebrews literally says we're protecting each other from hell. Because if, if we miss the rest from unbelief, there's only two alternatives. It's not a little less restful. Are you following me? It's not, I missed heaven by a little bit, and so now I'm going to have a little, you know, insomnia. No, it's either eternal heaven or eternal damnation. There's no, there's no middle ground. There's no waiting room. And so he writes with this language to implore us as a church to be good at exhorting one another. Now, I know, I know some of you, you know, the hair just stood up on the back of your head and you went, no, there ain't nobody here telling me what to do. Be careful with that. Because you've become a judge unto yourself. And that's a really, really dangerous thing to be. I, um, we do a lot of personality studies here what the leadership and all this. So we're trying to just figure everybody out. Um, and um, it gives us a way to filter serial killers when we're doing the hiring process. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, you're a little off right there. So um, here's what I found out about myself. Uh, the, way, the way to describe me is I don't have to be in charge, but don't tell me what to do. And in my head, that makes total sense. I don't have to run the thing. I can stand back and let you do what you need to do. But don't walk over and tell me what to do. I already know what I'm supposed to do. I'm standing back watching you do what you're supposed to do. And so I don't have to run it, but just do it and leave me alone. Anybody else in the room? Okay, you know what's really dangerous for us? It doesn't come natural to let people tell us. You don't get warm and fuzzies. And I imagine that goes for a whole lot of people in the room. The writer of Hebrews is saying, exhort one another because you don't want to miss it. You don't want to get into a pit of unbelief and sin. You don't want to let that take hold in your life. You don't want sin to take hold of your life. Come on, can you say amen to that? You don't want to let any sin take hold of your life. And he's saying the way to keep that from happening is that you become integrated into a body of Christ, into a church, not, just, not Sunday morning. Sunday morning is when we come and cheer and, and we look into the word and we try to figure out how to apply it. No, he's talking about being in a family, in an, in an interpersonal relationships where people know you enough to say, hey, hey, wait a second. Did you, do, are you, have you considered what's going on? Are you considering the choices you're making right now? We love you. What, are you going to keep doing this? This is not going to work out well. He's saying that should be how the church operates. You don't have to be happy about it for it to be true. This is the calling of the community. This is the calling of the church to exhort one another. It's worked out through a living and loving community, encouraging each other to belief and obedience. Now, if, if you grew up like, kind of like I grew up in, in old school church, um, this, this fashioned itself in a weird way. And we exhorted each other about the clothes we wore. Amen? We exhorted each other about going to the movies. And we didn't exhort each other about your VHS player in your house. Now you know that I grew up with the VHS tapes. And some of you young people are sitting here like, I don't know. This is real clumsy. You had to pull it out, put it in a rewinder. But we, we got the thing kind of backwards and it was called, uh, the general term for it, it was called legalism. Where we, where we really cared about certain rule following but we, we wouldn't address other things. So if you smoked, drank, and listened to rock and roll music, you were going to hell no matter what. <laughs> and if you didn't go to the movies, but you watched filth in your house, nobody would say anything about it. 
Some of you know what I'm talking about. The writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, this is not, this is not, they just came out of legalism from the Pharisees who we talked a couple weeks ago that wouldn't lift a finger to help anybody unburden themselves from sin. And so he says the, the purpose of the church, the purpose of the body is to make sure we all get there. Amen? Is to make sure we all get there. So it's about, it's not about judging you to make you feel bad. It's about coming along and exhorting you not to keep sinning because it never works out well. It's like he wants us to be Dr. Phil to everybody. How's that working out for you? So he says, exhort one another. Paul was so emphatic about sin in our lives, about crucifying this flesh, about putting sin to death. He would use terminology like this in his letter to the Colossians in chapter three, put to death, therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. He's saying to the church, help each other kill these things. Amen? And then he says, do it now. Hebrews chapter three, verse 15. As it is said today, look at your neighbor and say today. Today, not tomorrow for you procrastinators that are like, I like to wait till the end. I get my best work done then. <laughs> it's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying. By the way, if you let sin reign in your heart too long, you won't think about it at the end. Because sin makes a slave out of us. So he says today, if you hear it today, don't reject it. If you hear it today, don't put it off. If you hear it today, don't, 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 think, don't say I got time. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Don't do that. There's an immediacy to the calling. This is not an exhortation that can wait a while until the hearer gets things squared away, till we understand everything, till we, till we fully grasp, until we get all of the things we want to do out of the way. Come on, I, I know there's people around here like, man, if I give my life to Jesus right now, if I, say, if I get squared away right now, there's a whole lot of things I won't get to do. And you're right. And that is good. It will more than likely mean you won't go to prison. It more than likely will mean that you won't, that there's a whole lot of bad things that won't happen to you. And that in turn means you didn't get what, get to do what you wanted to do. Do you realize if we all got to do whatever we wanted to do in every season of our lives, we'd all be in prison right now. I know some of you have never had a bad thought and God's trying to deal with the pride in your life right now over thinking that. But listen, if we're real, nobody knows what goes through these things except us. And he's saying, don't put it off. Don't put it off. It's, he's calling the reader to listen to the voice and not reject it. If you hear, do not harden. We need to be aware of how God speaks to us. In the case with the Israelites, he spoke through Moses, and yet the people rejected Moses. Today, God speaks through his word, through the Holy Spirit, through the church body. And the warning is to accept the message and avoid unbelief. Accept what is written. Accept what he's already given us in the word. Let the Holy Spirit reveal it to us. Accept what is exhorted in the church. Paul dealt with this in Acts 28 with people who wouldn't accept it. Verse, chapter 28, verse 25, and disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying that your fathers through Isaiah the prophet go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. So Paul is quoting Isaiah telling the Jews, you, you refuse to accept it. You refuse to accept it. It says, for this people's heart has grown dull and with their ears they can barely hear and their eyes they have closed. 
lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Paul said, listen to this. You are working in unbelief here and God is going to turn and go after somebody else. That's what he told them. Listen, we all have a window of time and then it's up. It's just the reality of life. We all get this window of time and then it is over. And some of us are farther along in the roll of toilet paper than others. (laughs) But I know this. And I think I've made this, the end of the roll goes off a lot faster than the beginning. It's, it's just, you know, when it's this big, when it's this big, you're in trouble. It's, (laughs) can I tell you this? None of you know how much paper's left, including me. That's why he doesn't say, wait till you're 50. Wait till you're 60. Wait till you're 70. You got some life left in you. Just wait. Your grandparents lived a long time. Your parents lived a long time. You got some time. Just wait. And he said, no, if you hear today, because all, all we know is that we're hearing now. And it's a ton of planning out in front of us. We plan, we plan, we plan, we plan, but there's no guarantee to any of it. But he's saying, if you will listen, if you will embrace, if you will, if you will embrace this in faith and put your faith and trust in God, then your rest can be secured on the other side. Amen. Amen. Then your rest can be secured. But he said, if you turn around today and you reject it like the rebellion back in the book of numbers, if you reject it like that, then, then I can't guarantee you anything. And here's the truth of the matter. The longer we put off the voice, the deeper sin becomes entrenched and the more unbelief leads to disobedience. And if you want to have an unrestful life, keep following down that path. Because I've never had disobedience lead to rest. I've never had it lead to rest. So we got to get rid of the reasons, right? Right? Hebrews chapter three, verse 16, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt that were led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned and whose body fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to to those who were disobedient? So we, so we see that, that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So you got to ask yourselves, what? Why would the Israelites do that? You should go back to Numbers and read and read what happened. You read Numbers chapter 13. You should go back there this week and read what happened. God had miraculously, through the book of Exodus, miraculously led them out. They're free people now. Free people. Being led by God himself through Moses. They would stand at the foot of the mountain and see spectacular displays of God's power. They would see him provide for them. They would see him rescue them. They would see all these things exactly how he said they would flush out. And then they get to the edge of what he promised them. Get to the edge of, man, this is your rest. You're here. Go take it. And they go, we can't do it. We can't do it. We, um, we, have the, we have the same type of problems, right? We get to the point of decision and um, you're, in a, you're in a service like today or maybe you're driving down the road tomorrow and, and, and you start thinking about eternity. And you, and you gotta make a, you don't just get to think about eternity without making a choice. It's not like what you're gonna eat for dinner. So the Israelites had excuses. They would say things like, man, we, we could have, back when in Egypt, we didn't, it wasn't as bad. 
Back in Egypt, they would always point backwards. Back, back then, it, was, it wasn't that bad. We have excuses too, like, well, I don't like the way he said it to me. Maybe you're sitting here this morning thinking that. Maybe you're here and you say it's too late to change. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you say the Bible has just too many rules for me to believe. It's so restrictive. Maybe you're sitting here saying I don't like people judging me. The Israelites disobeyed God because they could not envision or believe that where he was leading them would be better than where they came. And that is still our problem today. The Israelites would challenge Moses because they would say back in Egypt, every time they would go back in Egypt, back in Egypt, we had meat, back in Egypt, we had this, back in Egypt, we had that, back in Egypt, back in Egypt, back in Egypt. And it was almost like they forgot that they were slaves back in Egypt because everybody likes the pain that they're familiar with, right? That's why we don't change. Everybody like, well, I'm just used to this pain. Well, you know what? The doctor says if I lost 30 pounds and I started running, but guess what? That would introduce pain that I'm not familiar with because I'm used to the back pain but then I would have to suffer pain by not eating what I want. And Lucky Charms are a gift from God. And the doctor never seems to understand that. I'm like, why would they be available if they weren't from God? Chris, have you exercised more? Well, you know what I did? I started exercising and I got more pain than I had before I started exercising. My wife saw me get out of the car the other day. She said, did you work out? And I went, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Um, they keep telling me this is gonna get better. So what we do is we embrace the pain of sin that we live with every day. And we try to figure out ways to medicate it. We try to figure out ways to numb it. And we try to figure out ways to, to just keep it from everybody else. And we try to figure out how to handle it all ourselves. All ourselves, we just, we just keep pouring on the, the symptoms. We just, keep, we just keep trying to dull the symptoms. And he's saying, listen, if you trusted me, I'd lead you to some place that was restful. But, but we don't like the pain of the unknown. And the Israelites couldn't get in their head. There are difficulties in front of us, but the God who led us through the previous difficulties is more than capable to lead us through the coming difficulties. They couldn't get their head wrapped around that. So some of you, some, I guarantee some of you are sitting here this morning going, if I turn my life over to God, then what? My question is this, if you don't, then what? Because we're not talking about whether, whether you make more money or less money. We're not talking about whether, whether you get a bigger house or less house. We're talking about eternity. And what, he's, what he told the Israelites was this, if you reject me here, you will not enter the promised land. And sure enough, 40 years went by and the generation that rejected him died in the wilderness without rest. And the writer of Hebrews is taking that story and superimposing it on believers in the church and saying, hey, listen, you better respond today. You don't want to get caught out in the wilderness being your own judge. You don't want to get caught out there. Because here's what we don't understand. All we know is the pain we're currently in. We can't even fathom the pain that could come from unbelief if we keep moving forward in it. And he's saying, you don't have to do that. Today, if you hear today, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Now, I, I need to, I need to uh, stop here for a second because if some of you have been churching a long time, you may, this is a passage of scripture that brings up some theological debates. And uh, I grew up, I grew up in, um, in, in a church that taught that you could lose your salvation. Anybody, 
Anybody grow up like that, that you could lose it? I mean, you can raise your hand. It's safe in here. Um, okay, that you could lose it. And, it. and it would work like this. In a teenager's mind, as a young kid in a teenager's mind, I would, uh, um, you, you'd come to Christ and, and you accept Christ as your Savior, ask him to forgive you of your sins. And the Bible says that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of those sins. Amen? And so I was like, man, I'm saved. And then I would go out the next day and I would cuss. I'd lose my temper. You know, you're 15 years old. You know what 15 year old boys think about, you know, so you're doing all that, you know, that's into it. That's part of it. And, and, and then by the end of the day, you're not saved anymore. Anybody else know what that feels like? At the end of the day, you're not saved anymore. And I was just talking to somebody about this this, this morning and, and you get home and your parents aren't there, can't get a hold of your grandparents and you're looking at your brother going, Jesus came, we didn't make it. <laughs> What'd you do today? I cussed and looked at a girl and I don't know what's happening, but Jesus just left me here. Anybody else feel that way? Okay. Now, I don't believe that anymore. I don't cuss as much as I used to, but I, don't, I still don't believe it anymore. I don't believe that anymore. I don't, I don't think it's that flimsy. Does that make sense? I believe he's covered every sin that I have sinned and his sacrifice covers every sin that I will commit. Albeit they should be less. I should be becoming like him. And so, so as I'm becoming like him, through the process of what we call sanctification, become putting off of myself and putting on Christ, I, I become more like him and more like him. And so, so, but I still wrestle with sin, everybody. So what happens is he is enough for all my past and all my future and I can rest in that. Now, some people in the church have taken that too far. And Paul addresses this. Some people take it too far. I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. Now, I've, I've come to Christ. He's forgiven me all of my sins in the past and all the ones I commit in the future. And I am going to do some doozies next week. <laughs> That's absurd. That would be like your parents giving you their credit card and saying, go to the grocery store and get these five items because they trust you. And then you go to the grocery store and you say, I got it. Everybody line up, man. We're getting this thing today. We would call that abuse. And so when we sin without regret, when we sin without a conscience, after knowing Christ, we are abusing the grace. Amen? Okay. So... So there's this big debate. Can you lose your salvation or not lose your salvation? And here's my message to you. You better not find out. Paul, or the, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, why would, you, why would you even try to find out? Why would you go down the path to even know if that's a possibility? If you hear today, listen. Listen, we're talking about an eternal rest. We're not talking about just, just, just three steps to live your best life. We're not talking about that. We're talking about eternity. And he's saying, don't harden your heart. Don't find out. Because he makes the example, everybody that rejected God going into the promised land was led out by him. Did you hear that? Everybody that stood at the edge of the promised land said, I'm not going in, came out of Egypt under his power and grace. So the writer of Hebrews is begging the church. If you've experienced his grace, don't reject it. If you, he's writing to the church. He's saying, don't, don't be like the Israelites who came to a certain point and they went, no more. We're not following you anymore. He said, that's a really dangerous place to be in. That's a really risky place to be in because just as they didn't enter their rest, you're not going to either. So can you lose your salvation? I said, I don't know. I'm not going to answer it. I'm saying, don't find out. 
don't even get close. He set up so many things to protect us. He put us in a body together. He put us in a place where we can exhort each other. He gave us his word. He gave us his Holy Spirit. He gave us Sundays and Wednesdays and Thursdays where we can be around each other, encouraging each other. There is no reason any of us should ever even think about falling away. We should be inviting people into our lives and say, hey man, would you check me for a second? Would you check me? Am I thinking about this right? Am I doing this right? Have you seen something in me that looks squirrely? When's the last time you looked at your wife and asked her really what her opinion is of you? You're like, I like the pain of the past more than the pain of the future. (laughs) When's the last time you looked at your husband and said, hey, listen, what what do you think about the way I've been acting lately? Are we, are we allowed to exhort each other or not? We're not dealing with hurt feelings. We're dealing with eternity. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, don't let it hang out there as a question mark. Be sure of it. Because he's calling us to enter this rest. Hebrews 4.11, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall, no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Let us strive together. Paul said that he would, that he would strive, he would strain to reach that that God called him for. This is a working it out in the body and personally. So as the unbelieving Israelites were kept from entering God's rest, but we don't have to repeat their disobedience. It's not a for sure thing. We, we hear it today. And we can choose whether we harden our hearts or not. We can choose whether we put it off. We can choose whether, whether we reject it or not. So listen, this is proof that he's not just talking about a rest for the next 10 years. He's not talking about a retirement. He's not talking about an easier job. He's not talking about better kids. He's not talking about all that. He's talking about eternity. And this is how you know. Hebrews chapter four, verse eight. The band's going to come up. We'll we'll close it up here. Because the Israelites ultimately did go into the promised land. Joshua, Moses' protege, took them into the promised land. It was pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. It was flowing with milk and honey. It was an amazing place. They did defeat their enemies. But that wasn't the final rest. So... So the writer of Hebrews is actually telling us to embrace God, to embrace Christ will bring you a a temporary rest on this earth. Yes. Amen. Could you say amen to that? Because I get to do all the things we've been talking about for the last eight, 10 weeks. I get to cast my cares on him. I get to not be anxious because, because he supplies. I get to all those things, all those things. His yoke is easy, his burden is light. That's for this life, that's for this life. The writer of Hebrews says, if it was just about going into the promised land, why would he point to something else? So the problem is, churches spend so much time trying to figure out how to have rest here, we forget about our eternal rest. We get so worked up about pain in this life and so worked up about it's not going my way and so worked up about it's not fair and so worked up about all these things and why didn't God do this for me? Why didn't God do that for me? It's because he's not 100% concerned with this life only. He's, his ultimate desire is to get you to the next life where eternal rest takes place. Hebrews chapter four, verse eight. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from him, from his. Listen, at the end of the day, uh, I'm, I'm not a preacher that's going to stand up here and say, you come to Jesus today, man, it'll be so much better. I don't know, it may cause you more pain. I know my doctor said working out was good for me. Next time I see him, I'm gonna tell him how bad I hurt. You 
You come to Jesus, and it might be a fight to kill some sin in your life. I mean, it might be a knockdown, drag out fight because now you're aware of it. Now you're submitting yourself to Christ and now he's pointing out things. Now you've come into a body and your friends are going, hey man, that's probably not great. You probably, let's adjust this, let's adjust. And it may be a battle, but I'm not talking about just having the easiest life here on earth. I'm talking about you not rejecting eternity. And for this 70, 80, 90 years we have on earth, I'm pretty optimistic. It's a blink compared to eternity. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, if you hear it today, don't walk away from it. It's that important. Don't reject it. Don't reject it. We're going to celebrate next Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead. First, he was brutally murdered for you and me. But then he became victorious. He conquered death, hell, the grave. He told the, he told the disciples, I go to prepare a place for you now. If it wasn't true, I'd told you, but I'm going to prepare a place. And he promised us that through faith in him, we would be able to enter into that rest that he's preparing for us. But you can't reject it and get there. You can't embrace sin and get there. You can't. He's saying, do not turn away like the Israelites do. So I'm going to ask you to do that this morning. Why don't you stand to your feet? Let's all do it. Let's all take a second to make sure we're lined up. I'm not saying you lost your salvation. If you cussed before you came in here this morning, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if if we're honestly getting into a, a rhythm of repentance and confession, then we got nothing to worry about. We can be at rest. If we're operating like the church should operate, we're encouraging one another, then we have nothing to worry about. We can be at rest here as we are guaranteed to rest later. So let's pray that way. Will you do that with me? You've heard it today. Don't reject it. Father, we thank you for what Jesus did for us. And we need to be forgiven today. Every day we need to be forgiven. So I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me this morning, Lord. And Lord, if there's somebody here that that they're praying this for the first time, they're realizing for the first time, Lord, I pray that as they confess their sins to you, as as they confess their faith to you, Lord, Lord, that there be a burden lifted off of their shoulders, that they find peace and rest in this life, in the fact that you've guaranteed us peace and rest in the next. Lord, we thank you for it this morning. Forgive us today, Lord, so we can be at rest tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Children Church, could you give him honor and praise this morning? Amen. And listen, be encouraged this week. Encourage one another this week. We'll see you back here Easter Sunday morning.